Maths and computing students. How many maths students have we got, by the way? Excellent. And com IT, networks, forensics, uh, computer science, and CGMA. <laughs> And CGP. So we've got somebody from everywhere. Excellent. Welcome back, everybody. What I want to do is to get, for those, how many of you have been on a placement as well this last year? That's about half of you. <coughs> and so the other half haven't. Now, what I want to do is to look at the sort of things you need to be doing over the next nine months and look back a little bit, particularly for those of you who are on placement here, um, to see. What is it that you really learned while you've been out there about being employed? And what I want to run through are some skills that the quality assurance agency, who kind of govern the, top, the, the way that degrees are put together and the curriculum designed, to look at the core skills that they're looking for for maths, statistics, and OR and for the computing, computer science, IT sort of side. There's two sets of standards. And I want to use both sets because we can learn quite a lot by looking at each other's um, criteria. And I want to, you to look back at what you've done and see how you have been able to fill in some of the gaps and then look forward over the next year for how you can maximize the benefits of what you're going to be doing, what we're going to be trying to help you to learn during the teaching of the formal modules and as you do your research for your independent studies project. So that you can really build yourselves up to become seriously employable, really great uh, employees in your job. Now I'm showing you this because this is where at the moment the, the um, slides I'm going to be showing you are living on a, a web page called Employability Resources on this one, computing.derby.ac.uk. I'm going to show you how you find it first. <coughs> how many of you know this website, our computing and maths website? Some of you do, great. So you know how to get there. I'll just show you how, what happens. At the moment, I have to go a slightly circuitous route um, until I can get Dave to put this page on the top menu section. So right down at the bottom here, <coughs> And we're going to be looking at this one. This is a review. The other thing you can find here are the full documents by the QAA um, at that bottom link there, which provides all of the formal documents that we have to use for our different programs and to identify subject-specific skills, uh, practical skills, and transferable skills. I'm just go through those as quickly as possible, just to give you an idea of what you need to go back and look at, because the reports you can get through there have the fine detail. I'm just going to give you the simple bullet headlines for each aspect, and then you need to go back, pick up the, the relevant computing or maths, uh, um, statistics, and OR uh, documents, and look at the real details of what you really need to be thinking about developing for employability. The maths ones are best because they are 2015 and really up to date. So they've been developed in conjunction with employers and academics so that you've got a really great understanding about what you're trying to achieve with your, um, <coughs> your degree to make you seriously employable. There's a tiny URL there that you can uh, get to. And that's the full link that's hidden behind the page I showed, I showed, the link I just showed you. And I've got, I'm going to take the, mo the model, the first pair, first of each pair of pages is the maths and statistics and OR page, followed by the computing ones. And the reason for that is that the maths actually has some very interesting things to say that lead through and help support and develop the computing ones as well. So three types of skills I mentioned, the thinking skills, the 
the really important background ones, pr then practical skills where you're demonstrating that you can do, because you know, employers want to know both that you can understand the subject area and that you can do your subject area. And then there's a really important ones, so those transferable skills, which make you really good employees. Yeah, you can be a geek with your cognitive and practical skills, but to be really employable in most jobs, then you need these sort of skills as well. And these skills can be used in any part of your life and in any type of job. They follow you around, whereas the top pair, the cognitive and uh, practical skills, may not be quite so relevant in jobs outside of your area. So that's the model we're using today. And as you can see, same sort of structure for computing. <coughs> Maths. Maths are our statistics. So I'm addressing about the, the guys that, well, some over there, I think some maths over here as well. But think computing students about these topics. Assumptions. Now in mathematics, statistics, OR, modeling, and so on, we always have to make very simplifying assumptions. Sometimes in computing, we kind of forget that actually what we're doing is based on assumptions about how the world works. We need to recognize quite explicitly what those assumptions are that underpin the work we're doing. Whether it's in your individual modules you're going to be doing over the next two semesters, or even more importantly, in that research project, your independent study project. Because you will, if you think about it, find you're making some fundamental assumptions at, at the very beginning. And you need to be thinking about those. And think of what happens if those assumptions aren't true. Mathematicians, you've got these lovely models that mathematicians build, that statisticians build, that analytics, and there are people build to predict the way things are going to work. But you need to understand what happens if those assumptions aren't fulfilled. If some data and game computing, computer science, if those, you haven't <coughs> got the error testing for the input data, the domain sort of uh, validity of the data, why do so many of our systems break when we're trying to use them? Because someone's forgot to test for an exceptional condition. So you can see some more items there. I'm not going to go through all of them. I expect you to go and look at this uh, afterwards to develop your ideas. Approximation is an important one for mathematicians if you're doing numerical uh, types of work. You need to understand specialist software, whether you're mathematicians or whether you are CGP, CGMA, forensics, IT, and other students. We've all got lots and lots of highly special, specialized packages. So you can see, I can actually run the uh, computing one from this lot to, to a large extent. Modeling. This is within the context of mathematical modeling, but it has just as much to say about those mental models that we create in our heads about the world around us. We're constructing a representation. It might be mathematical, it might be statistical, it might be uh, logical. Um, topological, if we're looking at networks, we're always doing modeling in our heads. We're doing modeling explicitly. But models are of no value unless we're actually using them for a particular purpose, to solve a problem. <coughs> and I was listening last night on the way somewhere to a rather interesting um, little discussion on Radio 4 about medicine. And the problem of treating the symptom, which is high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, rather than necessarily treating the underlying problem, which is with high blood pressure, for example, it could, it's actually, blood pressure doesn't really matter that much. It's the things that it causes that are important. And if we treat the symptom, not the underlying problem, we can actually cause serious problems. And a few years ago, the medics and the pharmacology co pharmaceutical companies found a lovely product that would reduce um, the heart rate speed if the people had tachycardia and so on. 
and it worked a treat. It reduced their heart rate down to the normal level. The only problem they discovered after a little while was it started killing people off because it was doing something else that they hadn't found. So we need to think about underlying problems, the second, the third order aspects that we may not have found, <coughs> the second and third order consequences, multiple scenarios, and to be able to interpret the analysis. And those of you who are from IT who've been using SAS and analytics will actually know the importance of being able to interpret the numbers. You statisticians, you come up with lots and lots of lovely parameters from the statistical analysis. What you really need to be thinking about is how do I communicate the story that underlines that data, those statistical parameters. So that's the interpretation. These are some of the critical domain uh, criteria or skills for computing. And if you think across to the mathematicians amongst you the, and R and statistics, you'll see that these feed back across to you as well. So what the message here is actually, we really ought at all times to be using both the maths and the computing sets of criteria, or you should be, to develop your understanding of what we're trying to do here what you are trying to achieve. See modeling there? Requirements, specification analysis, and so on, constraints. That goes back to what we just see on the math side. Critical evaluation and testing. Methods, tools, reflection, communication, and professional skills. All of these sort of things are really quite important, aren't they? For the mathematicians, again, at the top. Don't I remember that the CGMA, CGP, you've had to do some fairly serious maths in your, your time already. Come back. Each of these topics actually has something like a paragraph and a half or more, quite a long paragraph, that expands it and gives you examples of how all of these fit solving real world problems. So we need to be able to actually understand the problem and get to it's the real nitty gritty of what's, what it is, not think about the symptom. Because when you're out in business, how many of you in business last year um, found that your boss would give you a symptom problem that you needed to get underneath to really find out what the real issue was? How many of you found that? So you've all found that you've got to delve deeper than the first level. Yeah, good. Mathematicians, while you were out doing your uh, placement, there were a few weren't the mathematicians who were doing placement. Hands up. Mathematicians who did a placement here? What? Any more? Did you find you had to um, do some of these things here? Did you develop? Your skills doing that. You did. Excellent. So it proves, you know, what you know, the various hands up in the last couple of minutes are showing is you know, these things relate to what you will need to be doing next year. So you've got to build on that. Now, wherever we are, whether maths are, statistics, analytics, predictive modeling, networks designs, uh, security development and so on. We have to think about trade-offs. We cannot always, if ever, achieve the perfect solution. We have resource constraints, money constraints, time scale constraints, technological constraints that stop us doing everything that we want to do. And so we have to find that optimization, that balancing between what we want to do and what we can actually afford to do or even technically achieve. To give you an example more relating to the computing side, the architecture and so on, I was involved with a project back in 19, last half of 1999 
and we were loading data from legacy systems into SAP. And we had 20 megabytes of data, quite a large number of records, because each record was only about 40, 50 bytes long. So there's quite a lot of records as you can think, see. And the assumption in the project was we could load that at the last minute, uh, the day before the system went live. It turned out, actually, there were a whole range of te technological constraints deep inside SAP and Oracle that meant that, actually, it was going to take 24-7 for six months to load those 20, 20 megabytes worth of data. It turned out we couldn't load the data straight into a table with a table load. We had to use a single SAP transaction and drive it off the screen with a kind of a um, little, little app there that fed the data into the right transaction field and then automatically press the button. It turned out that that transaction was a rather heavy resource consumptive transaction. Half a minute, half a second of compute, half a second of database time and so on. And only one transaction could run at a time in the whole of the SAP environment. Whereas every other transaction in SAP, you could have as many, many, many dozens of them running in parallel. This one, one at a time. The bosses didn't believe that until they spent a long, long time, six months, trying to make it run in parallel. They couldn't. They, this, we discovered that in time, just enough time that they could load one third of the data by go live date. They then spent the next nine months loading the rest. <coughs> Technology comes up some bites at the time, and so we do need to think about the trade-offs that are needed. And the trade-off there was, with 30% of the data, we can just go live, we think, and we just did. Risks, security, safety. Well, some of you who have seen the problems with um, the interesting situations coming on with the Google car and the other autonomous cars. Serious questions of safety, serious issues to do with risks. And you know that last year, in 2014, there were a billion and a half accounts, personal accounts, hacked um, across the world. Lots of risks. Tools, deployment, and so on. <coughs> These transferable skills are really quite interesting. Have a quick look through those folks for a minute. solving and communication <coughs> types of skills. Were the technical skills more important? Hands up if you thought the technical skills were more important. Hands up for those who think these transferable skills are more important. That's about a hundred percent. Why were these more important folks? Any ideas? I'd like to share your ideas. I just found it was dealing with people. Like, when you're at the university, they don't teach you how to deal with other people who bullshit all the time. Being in the workplace, yeah, you can't have to deal with other people. So it's how to deal with other people. Okay. More contributions? Well, after two years, didn't really have that much. Which work program? <laughs> uh, uh, programming. Yeah. You didn't have that much technical skills that you could do in the workplace. And you learn as you go along. So you found your work placement really helped develop your technical skills, okay. but this helped you to pick up your technical skills. Any more thoughts about 
Anybody who's got a view the opposite that says the technical skills were more important or both more valuable? Okay, right. So suddenly we've cut, we thought, like everybody did, you know, all these cognitive skills about your domain and the practical skills are kind of up there, put numbers one and two and then transferable three. Interesting thought that. Now, the real thing is, yeah, we can talk about those skills till the cows come home. We can read about them and so on. But what are we going to do about it? Knowledge becomes important and interesting when we do something with it. And I want you to leave this session thinking about these six questions. Not as general to everybody, but to me specifically. Go through all of those se sections. You can either look at it just from the math side, if your maths are statistics, or computing if you are on the computing scheme. Or you can actually cross-fertilize and look at both sets. Because we're kind of interesting. And you know, those who I've taught, you know, you know that I bang on and on and on and on about comparing and contrasting. You learn something by adding things together or laying them beside each other. Which skills were absolutely vital for what you did last year? Particularly if you're on placement. But even if you weren't, still do this compare from last year to this year. Which ones did I rely on during the placement or in my second year? And then the cruncher comes, looking forward. What do I need to do during the next nine months here at the University of Derby? Which are the ones that I've got to improve? Plan your way forward. Where are you today? in each of those skills. Think about the gaps, the gap analysis between where I am today and where I need to be by March, April, May, June, and so on. Think about, with the modules that you're going to be studying over the next two semesters, plus your dissertation and independent studies, how are you going to use that time to improve your skill? Yes, I know you want to get a 2 2, two 1, or a first, whatever your ambition is. But just having a first may not get you the job you want. Because those guys out there who are recruiting you are looking for skills. They're recruiting a collection of skills in a brain. But in terms of your application to them, the job application, they're not just going to want to say, oh, I've got, I meet this, 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 this skill. Yes, how do I know it? They will want to see evidence of those skills. And so you need to be able to use this year particularly this semester, to actually develop those skills and acquire evidence of the skill levels that you've got. So that on your job application, it becomes quite obvious to them this application goes into the to interview box, rather than into the <coughs> round disposals box. Because, let's face it, they're getting probably tens or hundreds of applications per job, so part, they really were looking the things that are the evidence of your skills against these sort of criteria that can make them put it straight into this to interview, because otherwise it's so easy to uh, go on, dispose. So use this, I, I'm offering this to you so that you can use this lot as a me means of auditing yourself, planning your development through the next eight months or so, 
so you really become, every single one of you produces a CV with enough skills and evidence of those skills that your applications go straight into the to interview. You do this, and for those particularly in computing, you'll find the SOFIA framework, the SFIA, which uh, we have available, and is on the link on that web page there, <coughs> that allows you to really look at the skills that you're needing for different sorts of jobs and give you um, the criteria for one of seven different levels of skill level. By the time many of you finish the year, particularly those doing IT and forensics, <coughs> doing the module that I run next semester, you will be able to tick the box strategy setting, which is level six or level seven, the top levels. All the rest of you need to be thinking about how are you going to use your time here to tick the really high levels of achievement. You've got evidence that you've set strategy, you've defined strategy, you've developed strategy. Not many students have that uh, ability to have evidence of it, but you will have it in some of your modules here over the next two terms. Okay, folks, that's all I really have to say. But have you got any questions about what I've talked about, these um, skill levels, these types of skills, employability and transferable skills? <coughs> Let me just take you back then to the web page so you can see where... And then down here is the SFIA skills framework for an information age, mainly applicable to the computer computing uh, students, but there will be things in there that maths, OR, and statistics students will find interesting and potentially valuable. Because remember, these are the is the, that is the framework that many, many, many organizations in the IT world are using as part of their recruiting activity. They use this framework in here to identify the skills that they are looking for in you guys as they recruit you. And they therefore want you to reply or apply using that framework with the evidence from that framework. But the last thing is, remember those last points on the slide about the critical thinking ones. Think about these, because those who've been out in the real world have said these are more important. And for all of you, ethics and sensitivity in personal data will become important in one way or another, whether you're on the uh, analytics side with personal data, anonymized or not, or whether you're on the networks and thinking about the security you have to build in, or if you're in CGMA, CGP, the security because there are personal details involved, bank account details often. So that comes back in there. Okay, thank you, folks. Um, Dennis, do you want to say anything at all? Or? <laughs> nope. Okay, well, you're back in here, or you're in here at uh, 10 o'clock, and <coughs> there's a session on research and research skills and libraries and resources and things like that. I think that's a summary, isn't it, uh, Dennis, roughly speaking? Yes, that's fine. Yeah.